To talk about topologies of debt, I would like to start out from one of the references that was made in the call for this event, namely uh, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, famous comment on Nietzsche's remarks on debt in the genealogy of, of moral. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari in uh, anti Oedipus uh, highlight two observations on debt. The first one is that debt performs, as they put it, a territorial and corporeal inscription. And secondly, that debt inaugurates, just put, inaugurates a memory. And even, they add in parentheses, a memory of the future. So to Deleuze and Guattari, debt is a kind of primordial scene of civilization. It marks the human body and inscribes this body in a particular space and time, namely the space of territorial claims and the authorities that they maintain, and secondly, a temporality of accountability and obligation. So debt, in Deleuze and Guattari's reading of Nietzsche, it is a relation and a violently enforced relation, which is not just situated in time and space, but a relation that produces time and space in a particular way. Namely, the territorial distribution of possession and dispossession, and the temporal distribution of expectation and complying. So what Deleuze and Guattari interestingly suggest here is what I would call a topological approach. To think about this phenomenon, the relation of debt, again, not as situated in time and space, but as generative of a particular space and a particular time. So the question would be, of course, if we see the relation of debt develop historically, what kinds of topologies will result from the way in which this relation morphs? And that's really the question I would like to address. How does this configuration of debt develop under the aegis of financialization and what kind of time and space comes with the financialized version of debt. What happens to space and to time? Of course, we can say that financialization impacts on the space and the time in which we find ourselves existing. What happens to space in the era of financialization found a very beautiful and succinct formulation in Saskia Sassen's latest work where she puts it like this. Financialization has become, quote, a capability to securitize just about everything in an economy and in doing so, subject economies and governments to its own criteria for measuring success. So what financialization is doing when it turns societal values into credit yielding assets, it operates an enclosure of those values and those values that have become assets. Sassen uses Marx's term and calls this an enclosure by financial firms of a country's resources and citizens' taxes. 
So space is enclosed in another, in a new way under financialization. A different space and a different time, to be sure. If financialization works by identifying those assets that can be securitized and traded on financial markets, then, of course, financialization will thrive on debt. And as we have heard about already in Annie's talk, with the declining of real wages and austerity politics all over, and tax cuts and new state debt being issued, there's a rich, rich provision of debt that can be securitized. And on top of this comes the, as Arjun already underlined in his comment before, what is so important about the role of debt in the era of financialization is that debt is not expected to be paid back. It is expected to be continuously serviced. What happens then is we got a logic of amassment of debt and a subjection to an ongoing servicing of that debt, which will, of course, discipline any aspiration. You can call it an enclosure of the future, as we have an enclosure of space in the first dimension. If money, as Marx put it, is frozen labor, debt and credit now become frozen future labor. So time and space are marked in a new way, organized in a new way under financialization. And hence, it will also affect the way in which we experience time and space, the ways in which we think about time and space. You could say that the spatial temporal format that has come out of the present relation between debtor and creditor is becoming subjected to what Gerald Nestler has aptly baptized the derivative condition. Talking about space again, securitization is about the simple, is about diversification and about collateralizing risk positions with derivative instruments. Accordingly, the spatial organization of the debt relation, the territorial organization, as put in Deleuze and Guattari, can no longer be drafted simply as a relation between here the debtor and there the creditor. It has become a relation if you look at it from the creditor's perspective between a here, me, the debtor, and a translocal infrastructure that issues claims on me. And from the creditor's perspective, it's a relation between a revolving portfolio and an algorithmically constructed index of volatility based on finely grained data. So the spatial here and there is replaced by an other experience of space, namely between here and the ubiquitous presence of an infrastructural order that puts everything in relation to everything and becomes this kind of dispersed spatial organization. So if derivatives tinker with our sense of place, of here and there, it even more conspicuously intervenes in the understanding of temporal processes in our lives. Derivatives are made, to be sure, to counter contingencies that might occur in the passage of time, right? It's a kind of 
simple textbook version of derivatives. They can calibrate the future of the present to the present of the future, as Elena Esposito has beautifully uh, articulated it. And crucially, derivatives have the ability to continuously shift the temporality of any given asset. Because new derivatives can always be issued that can modify the past references uh, and the conjectural futures that are used to reference one given asset. You can change the past and you can change the future of anything and recalibrate it by subjecting it to a new mode of betting and evaluating it finally. Lisa Atkins has this beautiful uh, description of what happens to time um, in her book on, 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 on debt and time. She puts it like this. The securitization creates its time proper, a non-chronological arrangement of pasts, presents, and futures that are being coordinated by way of a derivative contract that can constantly be recalibrated. So talking about topology and the way in which the debt relation organizes space and time, we could say that under financialization, we are not only witnessing that space and time are being enclosed and colonized in new ways. We can also add that we tend to understand time and space differently. We understand now space as this kind of ubiquitous relationality and of time as this recursivity and repetition of something that can be changed and changed and changed again. Time and space are not just time and space, they're different temporalities and spatialities. And we see that financialization creates a new time space of our experience and our thinking about that experience. That's the reason why it might be interesting to coin this, um, this um, agenda that we have tried to do in our group um, to have an aesthetics of finance. Because finance has a world-making power that imposes formats of space and formats of time upon our experience. You could say that the space and time of financialization have become a kind of new quasi-transcendentals that are the possibility for the condition for the possibility of our experience of time and space. That is the way in which Kant was talking about the transcendental forms of intuition. We have some new quasi-transcendentals in the formatting of space and of time on the financialization. If there is such an aesthetics of finance, um, there is also a second question pertaining to what is an aesthetics of finance, namely the question, what kind of representations do we need to actually gauge and demonstrate this way in which time and space seems to work for us today? How can these new experiences be represented? We have new 
forms of time space, we develop then new narratives of debt. And these new narratives of debt must try to imagine and produce some new chronotopes with which we can make this new experience of space and time something we can understand and look at. What happens to the narratives of debt? If one wanted to make a very quick historical model, you could say, if you go to the realist novel of the 19th century, the mortification of debt is a very efficient mechanism of making a narrative configuration of time. Think about Lucien de Rubempré in Balzac, his failed investment in his appearance and the accelerated pace of his failed attempts to pay his debt. And furthermore, uh, the forgery of David Sechard's name on a promissory note that fatally ruins his revolutionary project and effectively ends the novel. It's the answering of the debt that provides the narrative motor of what happens throughout the last part of Les Illusions Perdues. Or think about the third part of Madame Bovary. She has underwritten those promissory notes to the provider of luxury goods, Lure, you all remember that. He sells on her notes and she is whirled into a crescendo of feverish and futile activity that will terminate in her inglorious death. In both instances, we have mortification of death, uh, of that as the motor of narrative progress in those um, and in countless other novels of the 19th century. The modification of debt drives the plot. The sense of the ending is where the debt is due. So there is a dramatic time of fatality that comes with this mortification of debt, which rhymes somehow with our expectations to a novel. In the age of financialization, however, this fatal logic of mortification gives way to this perennial servicing of debt And the race towards the end somehow ceases to be the primary narrative trope of contemporary narratives of debt. Instead, we have a time of, or a sense of time, as something which is always, already, and forever and a space of infinitely interwoven surfaces rather than those wonderful, simple plot lines that we knew in the realist novel. I have brought with me three examples that I just will comment very briefly on, on new and different organizations of narratives of debt. The first one is a novel by Daniel Kehlmann called F from 2013, which is a kind of humorous credit crunch novel. And with this title, F, which translates beautifully into English because it's about faith and finance and forgery. Luck for the translator. It is a novel about three brothers who are involved with faith, finance, and forgery, namely a priest, 
a hedge fund manager and a painter who is also a forger. Kind of an echo of an idea that um, our colleague Jochen Hörisch uh, articulated in the mid-90s in his book about the poetics of money, Kopfoder Zahl. He said, there are three ontosemiological instruments in the world. The Eucharist, money, and media. That can confer, as he put it, meaning to being by offering transcendence, value, and representation, respectively. So we have three representatives of central ontosemiological instruments. And then we have a history of how they try these three parallels to keep up the ontosemiological work of those instruments and how they eventually fail. Three, the, the main action of this novel takes place in the late summer of 2008, uh, where they, the three brothers at the same time experience the impossibility of maintaining the logic of forgiveness for the priest, of speculation for the uh, uh, trader, and so on. A breakdown that gives way to a very strange narrative universe that uh, one brother feels that space is shrinking on him. Another one melts away strangely. Uh, a third one is transposed in a universe without really understanding what happens. Uh, it is a novel that by these means represents and produces an image of a time which is out of joint and a space that have all kinds of strange wormholes, an allegory of different topologies that crop up when the habitual ontosemiotic operations are put under stress and eventually come to falter. And the interesting thing about Kehlmann's novel is perhaps less this allegory, but rather this upsurge of the fantastic or the phantasmagoric, the confection of chronotopes where things happen in a different way. A less playful or perhaps differently playful variation of, on the annihilation of the inherited sense of futurity can be seen in um, Michel Houellebecq's magisterially boring exercise in extirpation of aspiration, his novel Serotonin that came out earlier this year. It's a novel that has an interesting take on temporality. It is based basically on kitschy remembrances. And as we are talking about Uelbeck, these remembrances are mostly about selflessly loving and sexually servicing women, of course. And then a protagonist who relentlessly works towards preventing such experiences to turn into new expectations. This novel is a, an exercise in not wanting, trying to have zero effective involvement in what could become a future. And if Uelbeck is indeed an economist, as Bernard Marais had it. It is by way, I would say, of his meticulously elaborated series of exercises in contemplating an infinite present of non-promissory imminence. 
And the merit of this, of course, this slight shock that you have from recognizing a contemporary reality where any impulse to take an interest in anything is sedated makes it kind of interesting because Uel Beck's protagonist, he has all the words necessary to describe the world around him, but he don't seem to possess any longer the emotion that should magnetize these words and make the present be meaningful to him. So this topological arrangement we find in Uelbeck would be something like an immobilized landscape of negative eternity. Where the eternal availability of futurity is stripped down to be no more than unlimited representation, rep repetition of the same. A few words finally on a third novel that interestingly changes the representation of time and space. Um, Sia Haida Rahman's novel, In the Light of What We Know, from 2014. It is set out as a very straightforward and simple novel, simple undertaking, namely to give an account of an individual life. We have a narrator, he's a descendant of a Pakistani tycoon and politician and son of a physicist. He is raised in Princeton and Oxford, himself a mathematician and a first generation derivatives engineer in Wall Street and in the Square Mile. His narrative starts in the late summer of 2008, this recurring date in finance fiction, um, where he is suspended from his job and uh, inquiries are pending on his derivatives business. And he sets out here to tell the story of his friend Safar and his mysterious whereabouts. Safar. He has a trajectory which is almost an exact opposite of that of the narrator. He is of very poor Bangladeshi origins. He has grown up in a London suburb and he has been propelled out of an otherwise proscribed misery due to his talent for mathematics. And he meets the narrator in Oxford, he does first career in finance, another one in humanitarian law. So there are questions here in the relation between the true protagonists of race and of class, of Safar's struggle to adapt to Oxford, to, about his relation to a high-bred British woman, questions of coming to term with his own history, probably himself an offspring of the military rape campaigns around the time of Bangladeshi independence, of the vicissitudes of humanitarian work in South Asia with UN compounds, military and mercenaries, and much more. And then, of course, of the world of finance, of the math of finance, and the view of the world in the light of Finance. So it is a novel about an interesting late 20th century life reconstructed based on conversations in the warm fall of 2008. And then it is a narrative whose chronotopic structure seems to have been thoroughly, say, financialized whose spatio-temporal logic no longer obeys the traditional laws of narrative trajectories, relations of events in space becoming somehow, say, derivative. They are indirect and they obey different logics of interaction. And the relations of time within this narrative is concomitantly a curved and recursive 
and generally recalcitrant to steady successive pace of unfolding a story. So the narrative of this novel is set on excavating and relating Safar's story. But it becomes a throughout non-linear narrative. We don't follow a sequence of temporarily and causally organized events from one paragraph to the next in the novel. The link might be an association, a digression, a parallel thought, a whim. It is the technique of Proust who has been really maxed out here. The relations unpacked in the narrative encompass all kinds of whimsical leaps in time and space, translocality and heterochrony. A new set of operators of relations that produce a different space-time than the one we are accustomed to in the traditional realist novel. What is interesting, and let me end on this, in looking at the financialized aesthetics of these three very different novels, the slight uncanniness and oniric disorientation in Kielman, the bleakness and passive aggressive violence in Uelbeck. They seem to reflect a, financi a financialized world where, and this is another beautiful wording by Lisa Atkins, I quote, where the logic of speculation translates existing cartographies of the social into the topographies of speculation. We see this also in Rahman's novel. There is an aside here in an otherwise recurring discussion about maps. Safar says about the London underground map, quote, it never tells you where on earth any given station is. In one sense, it is no map at all but a diagram. It's not topographical, but topological. And the question then is always, what use is, ima is imagined for the map? In the light of what we know, sets out to appropriate some of the new topographical patterns that have become increasingly predominant in a financialized world. It accommodates them to relate a wide array of present day experiences in a war-torn, debt-ridden, unequal and insecure world. He provides new chronotopes to match present day topologies. No longer relating events in locations, but looking at infrastructural relays and passages on a global grid of relation. And from a time of fatality that we knew from the traditional novel to a time of spectrality and non-progress. Three novels that develop new representational techniques to match the new infrastructures of derivative relationality. And novels that kind of try to develop or to afford a kind of writing that becomes a prose of connectedness, a prose of affectivity, a prose of non-logic or non-linear relations that proposes to look at the world in a slightly different light and give us perhaps an idea of what it takes to live in 
this new topological arrangement that has been projected onto our social topographies. Thank you.